Um, so thanks for that very informative opening session, which brings together lived experience and science, which is the aim of MND Connect. Um, this is the first of our selected presentations in the treatment care and clinical trial space. And first up, we have Julie Labra talking about health inequalities for people living with MND in New South Wales. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you for having me, everyone. I'm super glad to be here to present the results of our research today. Um, I'll get the little jiggle. Um, when I was coordinating a motor neuron disease clinic in Sydney for many years, um, it was quite apparent to my colleagues and I that there's a significant divide across the state when it comes to accessing MND healthcare with some people having a really positive experience, whilst for others, it can be an absolute nightmare. We had limited specific data available on this topic. So we wanted to give people living with MND across New South Wales, the opportunity to tell us about their experience accessing specialist healthcare and equipment. We distributed online surveys to 471 people on the MND New South Wales database in 2023. 132 surveys were returned, yielding a 28% response rate. The survey included both open and closed-ended questions with open comments throughout. 75% of surveys were completed by a person living with MND and 25% by a carer. The voices of those living rurally were represented in 53% of return surveys. The majority were aged 65 years or over and had been living with MND for between one and five years. 6% of respondents lived in an aged care facility. 48% accessed the NDIS, whilst 42% had a home care package. So what were the results? Firstly, let's look at access to specialist healthcare. When the International Alliance conducted a global survey in 2022, the highest driver of people agreeing they had access to the highest quality healthcare was having access to a clinic with professionals who specialise in MND. Evidence tells us that MND clinics can improve survival, reduce hospital admissions, increase access to interventions and assistive technology, and increase quality of life. Globally, 76% of people in English-speaking countries have access to an MND clinic. In our New South Wales study, only 68% of respondents accessed a clinic, meaning New South Wales measures below global standards. If we compare clinic access for rural versus metropolitan, for people living in metro areas, almost 80% were linked to a clinic. For those living rurally, only 61% were linked to a clinic. If we extrapolate the results from our survey, that would mean approximately 150 people in New South Wales may not be linked to a clinic. Nationally, it could mean close to 700 people are not linked to a clinic. On this map, the crosses represent the locations of the MND clinics that survey respondents accessed. As you can see, things are looking pretty bare in central, western and northern New South Wales, where there are no clinics. Six out of eight clinics in New South Wales are located, with, uh, located within a public hospital and most of these are governed by catchment areas, meaning that people are often turned away if they don't live in a certain health local health district. Two clinics operate, operated within the private health system with associated costs to attend. 23% of our respondents were linked to a private clinic. Accessing a clinic is not the only problem in New South Wales. There's also significant variance in how the clinics are structured, staffed and funded. This slide shows a section of the New Zealand best practice recommendations for MND, listing the healthcare professionals that ideally should be included in a clinic. Most of the clinics in New South Wales 
do not comply with these guidelines. Some have no care coordinator, minimal or zero allied health, or no palliative care expertise. Also, most of the clinics receive minimal or zero dedicated funding, instead operated by individuals with a specific interest or passion on top of their existing caseloads. But what happens when those individuals move on, burn out or retire? Are the right structures and systems in place for those services to survive? With this information in mind, how did people rate the overall quality of their healthcare? Many were really happy, with 70% overall saying excellent or very good. 12% rep reported fair or poor. However, when we split these ratings into groups, we saw some alarming results. For the no clinic group, only 34% rated the quality of their healthcare as excellent or very good far from ideal. For the public clinic group, only 59% rated excellent or very good, also far from ideal. In stark comparison, 80% of people in the private clinic group rated excellent or very good, with none of these people rating fair or poor. There were numerous positive comments throughout the surveys praising the clinics and the healthcare professionals. But let's take a look at some of the not so good comments. I haven't had any MND healthcare. It feels like the clinic are only interested in the disease itself. The person is merely incidental. No allied healthcare at all, even though they advertise that they do. So what were the reported barriers and challenges? Regardless of where people lived or their age, people encountered numerous barriers, but the issues were certainly more frequent for those living rurally. Common access issues for both metro and rural were finding healthcare professionals experienced with MND and lengthy waiting times. Access issues specific to those in rural areas were 42% needing to travel long distances for appointments, a lack of lo local healthcare professionals, and 27% reported high costs, compared to only 2% for people in metro areas. Some more comments. Our neurologist gave us no direction, and it was a five hour drive to see them. The lack of local specialists means I travel interstate. Hospitals need more education on the needs of MND patients. Level 4 aged care package doesn't provide even half of the financial support that I need. How do people go accessing interventions? Surprisingly, there was no major difference in intervention uptake for rural versus metro. So place of residence didn't appear to impact on people's use of interventions. However, when we split the data into clinic versus no clinic, interventions uptake was higher for those linked to a clinic, particularly Riliazole and clinical trials. For example, 78% of people linked to a clinic were using Riliazole compared to only 54% in the no clinic group. What do people have to say about equipment? By the time I get equipment, it's no longer suitable. The NDIS is too slow and bureaucratic. Home mods, a nightmare. And people over 65 are being discriminated against. We have the same needs as people under 65. Some of the main themes emerging for equipment barriers were the paperwork, drowning in it. People are drowning in it. Inadequate levels of funding, particularly for those age 65 and above, having to navigate all the government agency rules and the inefficiencies, the approval and the delivery delays, and no local allied health to prescribe or provide training for the equipment. Telehealth. 69% had used telehealth and those that did, 86% were satisfied with it. 
and those linked to a clinic were more likely to have used it. When we asked people if they thought it would be helpful for them to regularly video conference with healthcare professionals who specialise in MND, 42% said they were either unsure or no, it would not be helpful for them. So whilst telehealth has many advantages and many people like it or want it, it isn't for everybody, particularly those with communication impairment who might live alone or those who are bed bound. Some comments. Telehealth is great because I don't have to travel or wait to see the doctor. It only works where initial communication has been face to face. Information exchange is fine, physical assessment, not so fine. I can't speak, so I need to be accompanied to such appointments. So today we've highlighted healthcare inequities in New South Wales related to where you live, your age, and how much you can afford to pay for healthcare. If we want to make things more equitable, we must improve access to public specialist MND healthcare for people living rurally, particularly amongst the current cost of living crisis. And the location of these services needs careful consideration and review to minimise travel time and costs for people. We also need to develop minimum standards for MND clinic models of care to ensure the structure, the staffing and the funding are in line with international guidelines as well as the people living with MND, their needs. We have a plan to share um, the results of our research with the members from MND New South Wales and the clinics and the healthcare professionals. And we hope that that's gonna stimulate some, some much needed discussions in, locally in the state. But looking ahead, it will also be important to explore healthcare inequities in other states, to identify similarities, differences, and potential shared solutions to nationwide versus state specific issues. This will need close collaboration between numerous stakeholders, including people with lived experience. I think we've been leaving them out of the healthcare discussions for too long. And they bring balance to these discussions. They bring the reality and the emotion. I'd like to thank all the people living in New South Wales who completed our survey. Um, extending thanks to St Vincent's Clinic Foundation for funding our project um, and my wonderful co-authors, Andrew Piers, um, Professor Parvathy Manon, and Hogden, Andrew Collins, and Professor Steve Buchik. Uh, thank you, Julie. Wonderful presentation. Um, we've got time. We do things a little bit differently in the MND Connect sessions where we've got time for questions um, to each presenter before we move on to the next. So any questions from the audience? Gethin. Sorry. It's okay. Never know if it's Got it right for once. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks very much, Julie. Um, I, I think it's very telling, um, all that you've said today. What I was interested in right at the beginning was, because um, a number of us presenting this afternoon will have surveyed people with lived experience of MND and how, just how difficult it is to get to everybody and to hear everybody's voice. And so I'm sure you'd love to know what the other um, 62 72 people were, were thinking about their health care in, um, in New South Wales. How can we get more people involved in these kind of surveys and Yeah, questions? you mean the response rate? Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Look, and, and when we were looking at designing this, this is one of the things that MND New South Wales particularly were telling me, Penny Waterson there and Andrew were saying that people are a little bit surveyed out. <laughs> um, and, and we knew that we weren't going to get a huge response rate with it um, because people um, I think are a bit overwhelmed by all the surveys at the moment. So how do we get everyone represented? I'm not sure. 
Susan, um, but that's a that's a huge challenge because definitely there'd be people that um, there's so many different opinions and experiences, and and we really want to capture it all, but it's it's really hard. Yeah, yeah. Does anyone else have any ideas on that? <laughs> And um, we had time for one last question, Gethin. Uh, hey, Judy. Um, that was a great talk, by the way. Really enjoyed that. Thank you, Gethin. <laughs> and um, my, my question is, so when you were surveying people, um, how satisfied they were with their care, did, could you split it between people receiving support from NDIS versus the aged care system? Oh, I did look at that, yeah. And actually there was no difference. Yeah, it was very similar outcomes. Because yeah. I thought that there would be a big difference there too. I think this lady had a question too. Did you have a question? Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Up you come. Your your question was how do we increase the uptake? Yes. So um, by only offering it online, you're excluding people who might prefer to do it in other ways. So um, we had uh, in New Zealand a... A very big buy into a um, really long risk factor um, uh, questionnaire a few years ago. And I think that the recipe of, for success, I wasn't involved, was multiple ways of it being offered. Um, the support worker, the support advisors taking it to people, having the option of somebody to help them. So I think. Mm -hmm. I think um, trying to get that number up as high as you can so that you do understand what those 72 other percent other people say is, is really good, but I think it needs to be multi-pronged. Cool. Thank you. All right. Um